Good morning, church. We are glad you're joining us this morning for worship. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. I'm glad you can be with us. My name is Pastor Bob Ryder, and this is the Wesley Church webcast. Where we are, if you're new to us, if this is new to you, you're just joining us, maybe you, you found us through Christmas Eve, uh, we'd encourage you to look at the comments under this video, and it'll direct you to where you can find some additional information about the church. And we always welcome you to give us a call, give us an email, and we'll be glad to further guide you in terms of how you can connect with Wesley Church. We have a weekly email that we send out, and if we don't have your email address, we'd love to add you to that weekly email. Just let us know. We'll put you on the email list, and you'll be able to be up to date on all the things that are happening, the ministries that continue here at Wesley Church. Let's just take a deep breath and quiet our hearts now as the light of Christ comes into our midst. May the peace of Christ be with you this morning as we join to worship our Lord. Let's sing together. Make this our invitation to one another. Oh, come all ye faithful.
Oh God, as we come into your presence again this morning, we are so thankful for your wonderful son who has been born, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, in this season, we are so mindful of this gift of salvation that comes as you become human and you dwell among us and we behold your glory full of grace and truth. As we come this morning to worship you, we're just asking that your spirit would move in our hearts. Lord, wherever we are, that we would just sense your, your whispers, your guidance, Lord, your love for us. And that we ask too that the things we do this morning in worship would just be so pleasing to you. That you would find them delightful as we have come here to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our first scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew 2, 13 to 23, and this is what happens after Christmas. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord, that's the wise men, when they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and they left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. So, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and your mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life is, are dead. So he got up and he took the child and his mother and they went back to Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, let's take a time of prayer together, and as I come with our prayer request, I would ask that you also be lifting them at home as well. Um, and, and I encourage you, if you have requests, to let us know through the, through the weekly email, and we'll get those in the email, but we'll also pray for them here on Sunday as well. And then together, let's close in the Lord's Prayer too. Let's go to prayer. Oh God, as we come into your presence, we are thanking you for the many ways you have answered prayers. Lord, we just lift up thank, thanks for those that we've been praying for to be protected from the virus. Lord, family and friends and parishioners, Lord, we thank you for the protection that you continue to give. Lord, we thank you that there is now a vaccine or multiple vaccines. And Lord, we're praying that as they will roll out in, in a way that is just unexpectedly good. And that many will be able to have the vaccine, Lord, and we'll begin to see the numbers begin to trend down and Lord, we just ask that you would bring again that normalcy that we so long for, a time when we can worship together again. We, we long for that, Lord, and we're asking for your miracles in the next months, Lord, as, this, as the vaccine and other kinds of medications are now becoming available. Lord, continue to keep safe our family, our friends. Lord, the parishioners that we love and know, keep them safe, we pray, as, as this does continue. Lord, we lift up Bill and Nancy and Kay to you, and we're asking for your love and guidance in that situation, Lord. Just give wisdom and care and strength. Lord, we're just, we continue, Lord, to pray for the Ryan Sieg family. Lord, give comfort as well. Lord, for, for Sean, we pray, Lord, that there would be healing. Lord, good news from any tests that happen. Lord, we lift up the Engel family at the passing of Jeanette. Comfort 
her family and her friends, especially Joanne, Lord. Let your spirit just comfort them. Lord, we praise you that my mom is, is out of the hospital and back home. We pray you would continue to give her recovery. Lord, we, we also just want to lift up Jim to you, who is 90 years old and is, now has COVID as well. We pray, oh God, that you would just put your arms around him and let his body heal from this virus. Lord, we're all, we all have different requests on our heart. As I am silent, we are lifting up those requests to you. Oh God, in faith we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's sing together again. There's a song in the air. God sure is faithful to continue providing for us and caring for us. And we just worship God with our tithes and offerings.
Let's join our voices together in a prayer of dedication. Loving God, we celebrate your arrival among us. We bring ourselves and our gifts as worship. May our offering be a sign of our faith and love for you. May these gifts be a blessing to many through Jesus, who is our Messiah. Amen. All right, kids, I have something special for you again this morning, and so come close to the screen. I don't know if you were able to tune in on Christmas Eve, but Pastor Debbie had a big plate of cookies, and I tell you, they were just so tempting to me. While she was talking, I just wanted to reach over and grab one of those. I don't know how it is in your house, but we have, uh, you can see this picture of this candy dish. We have candy dishes around the house. And this is one that sits uh, different places in our house. And there's always a little bit of candy in there during Christmas Eve. And I know I should not give in to the temptation to eat a piece of candy every single time I walk by. But boy, I, I did. I was eating too much sweets, too much candy, and it just wasn't good for me. Do you ever have temptations like that? You know, it's easy to be tempted by things. Sometimes the things we're tempted by are really bad, though. Sometimes we're tempted not to obey our parents. And maybe our mom or dad says, you need to clean up your room, or it's time to come in from outside, and we don't listen. And we're tempted to do something that we want to do instead of what our parents want us to do. Sometimes it's a whisper that, that is from God's Spirit. Like maybe God's Spirit wants you to be nice to someone that maybe you haven't been that nice to. A friend at school, maybe it's a sister, a brother, a cousin, and you just know you should be nice, but you haven't been nice. Or you're, you know, you just mistreat somebody. And it's like, it's like the devil whispers to us and says, you, you will like it better if you do what's bad instead of doing what's right. And those kind of temptations come. But you know what? We don't have to give in to those, those kind of temptations. There's a Bible verse from James I want to read from you that I'm going to put on the screen here. It says, So then, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Wow. So the temptations we have, we can, we can listen to God. We have the power. When we feel that temptation, we have that power to say no to that temptation, whether it's mistreating someone, whether it's not respecting our parents' wishes, whatever it is, uh, we have the strength. And we, you know, we can't say that the devil made us do it because we can, we can resist the devil. We can resist the temptations that we might have because of Jesus. Jesus gives us that strength to do that. Let me pray and ask God to make us all better at resisting temptation and submitting to God so that we don't give in to the temptations that are bad. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you that Jesus came to set us free from temptations, or at least the power of those temptations, to force us to do things that we shouldn't do. Lord, thank you that, that Jesus gives us power to overcome temptations. I pray for the kids of our church, Lord, the kids of our community, I just pray that you would give them strength to stay on the path that you have designed for them, and that you would wrap your protection around each one of them. Lord, may they sense your power to resist bad decisions, to resist evil. Lord, the things that would take them in a bad path in life, let them be able to hear your whispers and resist the devil. that He might run away from them. We pray this through Jesus, who is our Lord. Amen. Well, let's sing another song together, Away in a Manger.
Our second scripture lesson is from the Old Testament prophet Hosea, verses 1 to 8. Hosea writes, he's speaking for God, he says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more that they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the balls, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arm, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I led them like like one who lifts a child to my cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt? Will they not, will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, even though they call me God most high. I will by no means exalt them. How can I give, how can I give up on you, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. I have a feeling you have heard of this plant. It is a Venus flytrap. I am totally fascinated by this, uh, by this plant. It has those leaves that you see there in the picture. It has the ability, if, a, if an ant or a spider, not, not usually flies, but some insect will walk across that leaf and trigger the sense that it knows there's something walking on its leaf. It can trap whatever it is that's in the leaf. Now, it's very smart, so it'll feel one trigger, like one step or one one bump by an insect, and then it'll wait up to 20 seconds to see if there's another bump, another trigger, to to make sure that it's really, truly something that's alive and not just a leaf falling on it. And if it gets that second bump, that leaf will slam shut on its prey, whatever that insect is. And then it still waits, and it waits for five more triggers, five more bumps, to make sure whatever it's closed its leaves on is actually a living creature. And if if it gets enough sense that that's what it is, it seals itself airtight to be very efficient at digesting this thing that it has caught. And then it takes up to 12 days to digest its prey that it has caught. Now that, I know that's disgusting, but I think you just think about how amazing this is. The colors of the plant and the aroma of the plant attract insects, attract its prey. So it is very attractive and at the same time, very destructive. In the Old Testament, ancient Egypt was like this human flytrap. It had this ability, it has this attractiveness that was always pulling at the heartstrings of Israel and yet it was just massively destructive. Do you remember those stories? And then we hear today in our Bible lesson that when Herod is doing his worst to try to kill Jesus, God leads, God leads uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus to Egypt. Why in the world Egypt? Isn't that strange? I mean, that's strange to me when you think about all that Egypt represents. Why would God take them to Egypt? Well, the setting was that Herod had talked to the Magi, the wise men, and asked them to report the location of Jesus. And 
He, and they didn't. They didn't come back to him. And he was very angry. He had heard through prophecy, through his, his, uh, his wisdom sayers, that there was a king born. And it sounded like it was Jesus who was born to be king. And that was a threat to Herod. So he, Herod borrows from ancient Egypt something that the Pharaoh of Egypt did back in Moses' day. He announces that all baby boys are to be killed. This is, this is Herod's way of trying to eliminate the threat of who Jesus might be, a king of the Jews or more. Now, God knows that Jesus can't be around if that's going to happen. And so God leads them to Egypt. And it feels to me at first like, boy, this is out of the frying pan into the fire from Herod, who's using Egyptian tactics, then headed to Egypt? Let's just quickly look at what Egypt was in the Old Testament. You might remember the very beginnings of Egypt. It appears to be a bit of a breadbasket. You might remember when Joseph is there and Jacob, his father, brings his brothers, Joseph's brothers, and they come to Egypt for food because there's a famine in Canaan. And so they look to Egypt, and it does look pretty appealing. It looks like there's plenty of food in Egypt, and they head down to Egypt to get that food. And, of course, what happens is they stay, and over a long period of time, they become enslaved in Egypt. They become a threat to Pharaoh, and they become enslaved to Egypt. A little bit like that human flytrap, as I mentioned there are hints, though, in the book of, of Genesis that Egypt isn't all that it appears to be because when the famine actually comes to Egypt, the government has stored up plenty of grain for the famine. You might remember that, that Joseph has a, a vision of, and, and he, he sees the famine coming, and so he has the government store loads and loads of food to get people through that famine. But Egypt doesn't give it to its citizens as aid. It requires them to bring their livestock and their land deeds in order to get the grain. And so through the famine, they deprive their, pres their peasant citizens of home and livelihood. And uh, you get the sense that there's something more going on than just a breadbasket here. These are not, this is not an or uh, a country that is taking care of its own citizens but oppressing them. Of course, as I mentioned, uh, Israel stays in bondage, in slavery, in Egypt for quite some time, but God comes and rescues. You remember, uh, tell, old, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses goes and, and on God's behalf and, and, and has the people of Israel set free from Egypt. And then from then on out, People, the Israelites sing. It's in their poems, it's in their songs. They sing and they say about how God was sovereign over Egypt and how God was sovereign over Pharaoh and how God worked it so that God's people could be set free from Egypt. But you remember the prophets kept saying to the people, we better keep the covenant that, that we have with God. We better stay in this relationship actively with God because if we don't, we can end up back in bondage, in slavery, in Egypt. That's a regular cry of the prophets. They say, if we don't take care of the widow, and if we don't take care of the orphan, and if we don't take care of foreigners who come to our land, then we should expect to go back in bondage because that was what God expected of us as people. And of course they do end up back in bondage for a while. Now, this synchronization with Egypt, uh, as we, we heard in our second passage, continued. In fact, by the time of Solomon, Solomon's reign looks an awful lot like Egypt. Sol in, in his historians, four verses in the Bible indicate that Solomon's his greatness is partly due to the alliance that he has with Egypt through marriage. So his greatness, his power, his authority is dependent on his alliance with Egypt. And he begins to do things that look like Egypt. He begins to disregard the covenant that he has had with God, uh, that the nation has had with God. He begins to take slaves to do different kinds of building projects. He even begins to overtax, like massively tax the people of Israel. So 
that slide just continues. And it's like the people of Israel know that the ways of Egypt are the dark side, but they keep giving in to that temptation. They know that the sovereignty of our, of our Lord Yahweh God is the one, is the God they should follow. But man, the appeal of Egypt is just something that overtakes them. So what in the world is this about Jesus going down to Egypt? Hosea, Matthew brings this out in our passage. Matthew mentioned this verse of Hosea's where Hosea speaking for God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt, I called my son. So this is a verse that speaks about Israel as God's son, but it also doubles as a verse, as we see from Matthew, that it's talking about Jesus as God's son. So God sends Jesus down to Egypt in solidarity with us and with Egypt, with, excuse me, with Israel. Like Israel did it, but didn't do it well. Being out of Egypt, coming out of Egypt was something that they kept pining to go back for. But Jesus goes down and he comes back out without being tainted by who Egypt was, without giving in to the temptations of Egypt, without, uh, without being a king that reigns like Pharaoh or even Solomon. He is able to leave Egypt and be a different kind of king and a different kind of savior. And so he's a bit of a proxy. I think this is why this is in the Bible. We come into the world and it's so easy to give in to temptations. But here Jesus goes into the world, which Egypt is sort of a picture of that, and he's able to turn around and come away from it untainted. He's able to not give in to the temptations. And then Matthew sort of sees him like a new Moses. Moses led the people out of Egypt. Now Jesus comes leading us out of the ways of the world and offering to us new life, a new freedom that we don't have, that we can't find in the world. He's offering to us wisdom that is God's wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. He offers to us a law, which is not the laws of the world. It's a law of love. He offers to us a sustenance, which is, again, unlike the sustenance of the world, God's sustenance is ju always just enough instead of abundance and abundance and abundance it's always just enough whatever we need we have and then he offers us the protection of God's angel armies it's a very different kingdom than the kingdoms of this world and he offers us eternal life not just life in this age but life in the age to come so in Jesus when he symbolically when symbolically he is to go to Egypt and come out of Egypt He's showing us that he has a victory over the world, over the things of the world, over the ways of the world, over the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He, has, he is not tainted by those. And then he offers that way of life to us, to not give in to, to not be tempted by, to, not, to the point of giving in to, the ways of the world. He comes out of Egypt. Where might you need to come out of Egypt today? Where might there be temptations that you're sort of lingering with a little too long? Where might there be things in your life that you know you are giving in or synchronizing with the ways of the world when you have been given the citizenship in God's kingdom and this relationship with God? Where might that be? Will you bow your heads for just a minute as you think about about this. Jesus, on the night that before he gave himself for us, he prayed to the Father and he said, they don't belong to the world. Talking about his followers, he said, they don't belong to the world just as I don't belong to this world. Set them apart, Father, for your truth. You know, that's the intention of God for all of us. To set, we don't belong to the world. God wants to set us apart to the truth of his word. Is there something today that that comes to mind, that spirit might be whispering in your heart, and you need to say, it's time for me to walk away from this. I have the power to walk away from it because of Jesus. Oh God, we, we just ask for your spirit's guidance, Lord. It's so easy. The world is so attractive many times, and we would walk right into destructive situations, but Lord, set us free. Let us 
Have the courage and the strength to recognize that you have done everything that needs done for us to live a life of, of godliness. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's sing again, Once in Royal David City. Now, by God's power, may we faithfully follow our Lord Jesus, who lived in this world, but not of it. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.